Well, g'day New Zealand and welcome to the Dairy NZ political panel as we head towards our October 17 election. The combatants, let me have a look, Damien O'Connor, Minister of Agriculture, David Bennett, National Agriculture Spokesperson, Mark Patterson, New Zealand First Ag Spokesperson and South Otago Farmer. And I should mention also that Damien and David have a farming background and James Shaw, Green Party co-leader. James, I'm not sure about your farming background, but we will find out in a minute. Let's kick it off with an alarming statistic from Dairy NZ's View from the Cowshed report. Now, this was the snapshot survey Dairy NZ did uh, a couple of weeks ago when asked about the expected outlook for their community over the next three years. 64% of farmers said they expected things to decline for their community. Only 6% said they expected things to get better. Do we have a farmer confidence crisis in this country? Well, it's a question to you all, and I'll give the first shot at this one to the Minister of Agriculture, Damien O'Connor. G'day, Damien. You're right, how are you, Jamie? Um, look, 66% of farmers said that they'd recommend dairy farming to their children. I'd say that indicates that they do see a positive future for the dairy industry, otherwise they wouldn't recommend it. There are always issues, uh, be it climate, um, financial, as is indicated here, and in fact, financial challenges alongside regulations um, and, and the media perception are, are, are all equal at about 60% uh, concern for dairy farmers. Look, there's a multitude of things that uh, you, know, you can focus on as being challenges or you can focus on the opportunities. And I'd say this is the biggest, most successful industry uh, you know, uh, that, that we have in the country. Have for a long time, still have, and still will for a long time. So I think there's a great opportunity in the future. I don't think there's any... Uh, crisis of confidence. Oh, nothing to worry about at all from the Minister of Agriculture. I wonder what the National uh, Opposition spokesperson, David Bennett, uh, Hamilton, well, Waikato Kaukoki, has to say about it. Surely these numbers, David, 64% of farmers can't be wrong. No, thanks, Jamie. And I uh, just want to acknowledge uh, the other panellists and also all those people out there that are carving and doing the hard yards out there at the moment. It's really tough time and busy time on farms. So, just want to acknowledge the good work they're doing out there at the moment. Um, yeah, it is a crisis of confidence in, uh, by the farming sector, and they know what's going on with this government. Uh, they know that this government has plans around what they want to do to their um, dairy sector going forward. Um, you know, we've had prolonged attacks from the government over the three years they've been in, in, in government that suddenly changed when COVID came along and, and farmers were the flavour of the month. But, People are not silly, they see through what this government's going to do. You see the freshwater reforms that have just come out, what that means for Southland and North Canterbury. Um, the, those farmers are up in arms because they know what that's actually going to mean on their farms. Um, every farmer knows that the tax policies that Labor and the Greens are going to come out with will be a disaster for asset owning businesses like farmers. Uh, so they're genuinely worried about that tax policy. And it's all right for Damien to go on about how great the dairy sector is going forward and that, but you know, the reality is we haven't seen that from him as minister. Um, and he's got this great plan around doubling New Zealand exports and-, and No, no, that was your plan, David. Dairy only accounts for four billion of that. And, and the second point of his re reform program is um, to have uh, carbon emissions reduced, uh, methane emissions reduced on farm, it's gonna cost five to 12 billion. So. It just doesn't stack up. Farmers are smart business people. They know when they've been sold a pup from this government and they're not going to have any of it. And that's why they've got no confidence yes, in them. And I'll just ask the panellists, please, Damien, your worship, minister, uh, please do not interrupt another panellist while they're speaking. You're not in the house now. No, and I'm have, a bit tougher than Trevor fact. Mallard. All right, James Shaw, Green Party co-leader. We've got one for, one against. Do you think there's a farmer confidence crisis in this country? Well, look, I mean, the sector is the, carries the largest amount of debt um, in the country. Um, uh, you know, it sort of roughly equates to um, household mortgage debt. Um, it's no great surprise, especially when you've had the kind of bounces around in the commodity price internationally over the past few years that people go through periods of, of feeling a squeeze, you know, it lightens up for a while and then it squeezes again. And, and so, you know, I think the strategy that the sector has had for some time, which is to try and move from vo volume to value, um, is, is the right one, but clearly it's one that we're still working on, right? So, it, it, you know, it has, we haven't yet managed to uh, consistently get the top end of that value. Um, and I know that, 
you know, people like to attack the water reforms and, you know, climate change uh, reforms and so on. Actually, uh, what we know is that the greatest value that our um, farmers can get for their product overseas um, is at the high end where people can see that it is grown sustainably and, you know, pure New Zealand soil and air and, and water. Um, and that actually, uh, you know, when, when you get the kinds of stories about, um, uh, you know, that perhaps the providence of our product isn't as great as it's cracked up to be, that's actually what devalues the product and exposes it more to the commodity price shifts. So, you know, look, it doesn't surprise me um, to kind of see to, to see those numbers when you're kind of looking at the level of indebtedness that you have and that exposure to that international commodity price at all. I would argue though, um, that rather than arguing for a continuation of the status quo, um, as David Bennett is, um, that what we try and do is, is to actually continue to underpin the New Zealand story of our products um, and, and the way to do that is to, is to move to that really high-end sustainable form of farming um, and I would argue that the reforms that this government has been putting in place help to underpin that although I know that it doesn't necessarily feel that way uh, at the time. Well we've got two against a farmer confidence crisis and one for Mark Patterson casting vote for you New Zealand first you guys like, um, kind of like disagreeing with most things. Where do you stop? <laughs> Accelerator of, on good ideas, Jamie, and a, a handbrake on bad ones. But um, look, I think you know we've got to we've got to acknowledge that those are the figures that that have been presented to us. Uh, it is a time of considerable uncertainty. I don't think it's helped by heightened rhetoric uh, that we heard from David just before. It's uh, worth noting that the the sector as a whole is in a really good space since we've cranked out three years of record exports. But there is, you know, uncertainty around the COVID stuff. Uh, there's been a tsunami, and there has been, we've got to acknowledge it, a tsunami of new regulations, uh, and we've got to bed those down. I think it's the uncertainty around those, and that's starting to become clearer. Farmers can now see what they're dealing with, and I think farmers are uh, innovators and adapters uh, and will uh, handle these new uh, the new paradigm we find ourselves in for the reasons, <clears throat> pardon me, for the reasons that we have to, we have to put ourselves on a more sustainable platform. So uh, whilst I acknowledge the, the figures, I am optimistic about the future uh, and, uh, you know, our challenges to, uh, to take farmers with us and, and raise that level of confidence along the way. All right, we'll call the result two and a half to one and a half. Look, we've got uh, six topics to get through, so we might have to speed the answers up a tad, gentlemen. So we've talked about farmer confidence. By the way, we're going to uh, mental health next. This is a real issue. Digital connectivity, climate change, water storage and water quality. So let's rip into mental health. Now, I think we would all agree there is a bit of an issue here. And Damien, I'll go back to you. That was an alarming stat out of that Dairy NZ survey. 62% of farmers said that they or someone on their farm had experienced mental health issues over the last year. And the good news is it's not all the Labor government's fault. Look, I, I think- Serious we, subject. I, I think um, we've acknowledged the, uh, I guess, the influence of mental health across our whole economy and our community. And that's why we've put $1.4 billion into uh, mental health funding because it's been underfunded for a long time. Um, we, we kind of just roll on and particularly in the rural areas, just kind of pretty stoic. People are used to challenge and change and, and they're kind of uh, working alone quite a lot of the time. Um, don't necessarily, you know, can't just drop in for a cup of coffee with a neighbor, can't go down to the local cafe like they can in the city. So people do tend to internalize what are challenges. It does uh, manifest itself in, in mental health um, problems sometimes, but I think we're getting better at, at admitting it and discussing it. And I have to thank, um, you know, a large number of farmers across the country, the country who are prepared to put up their hand and say, look, I was challenged by this. Um, I needed to reach out and get some help uh, over the fence or with the family. And, um, you know, if you feel like this, then please reach out for help. And we're putting in place the resources and we've got to make sure that what the money we've given to the DHBs actually can get out into rural areas. Um, through Rural Support Trust and many other organisations that, that are out there, um, Dairy NZ, Beef and Lamb, if people recognise that, that there might be a mental health issue with someone in particular, then they should um, do their bit to help. Okay. Yeah, I agree with you. Some great work being done with, by the likes of Farm Strong and Will to Live. Uh, but David Bennett... 60% of those surveyed identified changing government regulations as the biggest cause of mental 
health challenges on farm. This is not a climate issue, this is not a finance issue, it's a government policy or regulation issue. Totally right, Jamie, and as the Minister said, you know, it's a stressful time and we acknowledge all those that do go through mental health issues, so um, it is difficult. Uh, but, you know, 60% of, of the participants said that the regulation change of this government is the reason that, um, that they see they have mental health issues on farm. And, you know, we see those water quality issues that have just come through. Um, you know, it's all right for Mark to talk about um, a sustainable future and we all have to adjust and uh, tsunami regulations. Those three parties together have brought this on the New Zealand farming base. They're the ones that have imposed these regulations. And you go to Southland at the moment, there's a revolt going on there around um, you know, the winter grazing. You go up to North Canterbury and you have the nitrogen rules. Farmers want certainty and they want rules and regulations that are practical and science-based. They are willing to adjust their businesses and adapt because they see the sustainability aspect that James talked about in, the, in our consumers. But they want to do it in a way which it can be achieved and they want to know that government's going to go with them and work with them and not put arbitrary rules on them that just don't take into account the way that they farm in their area. And so this government's got to take a lot of responsibility um, for what's gone on out there because the farms have said that 60% of them see the regulation changes as a problem. We want certainty as farmers. We don't want a government that's going to put regulation on that's unachievable and that's All right, and the, and, the, and the interest of keeping things moving, I'm going to throw it to you, James Shaw. Do you accept 60% accept of the responsibility for the mental health issues on farm? Well, I, I accept 60%. Do you accept that? I, no, I, I, accept, I accept that, um, you know, the, the, the numbers of people who have said that are very large. Uh, and um, you'll forgive me for sounding a little defensive about this, um, but... Uh, the fact that the previous government um, largely ignored this um, has meant that um, the issues have gotten worse over time. And it means that rather than having a very kind of graduated, um, you know, shift over a long period of time, you end up having to do it over a short period of time. And that makes it, uh, you know, a more, a more challenging um, uh, kind of set of circumstances to work with. Um, that's why we took the approach that we did with the Zero Carbon Act, which David's party voted for. Um, um, which is to see a gradual change over a 30 year time horizon. Now I know, you know, um, when you look at 30 years out, some of the numbers sound quite big, but if you just talk about it at 1% a year, that is an, that is an incredibly gradual uh, transition that, that we're talking about. I do want to say this and, and Jamie, um, uh, please don't get defensive about this, but I, um, and I'm not normally one to have a go at the media, but I do think that farmers uh, who largely listen to talkback radio are consistently told by people like Mike Hosking and David Bennett uh, and others that um, everyone in the city hates them uh, and that um, we think that farming has no value and it's got no future and anything like that. And it's rubbish. Um, and actually, if you look at any of the surveys that have been done around the country of people's attitudes towards farmers, people have a lot of time and a lot of respect for farmers and want our farmers to do better. Um, and so I, I, th I think that a lot of what farmers hear while they're out by themselves on the tractors doing the work um, is, is rubbish, to tell you the truth. And it's no great surprise to me that that then manifests in mental health issues. And so, you know, look, I'm, I'm more than willing to take responsibility for, you know, for, uh, you know, the kind of work that we do. I think that we have been very mindful of the pace of change. Um, but I do think that um, we're not the only ones who are responsible for the effects that um, are on people's mental health. And I, I think that there are some out there who need to be a lot more responsible with the language that they use and throwing around the kind of incendiary and polarizing language that they have consistently thrown around for a number of years. Because that doesn't surprise me that that ends up with very poor mental health. So some fair comments there from James Shaw. Mark Patterson, should we give up hugging trees and hug a farmer instead? Well, you're going to plant a billion of them, so there's plenty of opportunity out there. Yeah, well, I'm not too keen on getting too many hugs myself, so uh, maybe <laughs> some other uh, farmer. But um, look, I think we do have to be concerned about that, um, that figure. But I think if we can look at the silver lining of that, it, we've come a long way, though, haven't we, where we've actually got people that are prepared to acknowledge that they're they've got issues and I think you referenced Farmstrong and the Rural Support Trust 
uh, and there's a myriad of other uh, outfits uh, out there, uh, John Kerwin, Mike King, that have, have really mainstreamed this. So people can reach out for a bit of help. And I think, um, you know, Damien referenced the, the huge amount of money that's been poured into uh, mental health. And some of that is through having uh, services available at your GP so that for those mild to the moderate cases uh, that people can be seen at an earlier phase. But in terms of how much can be sheeted home to politicians, I will just pick up on what James said. I think the political discourse actually, and, and the media as well, but the polit political discourse is important in this. And I, I reflect to David that uh, Barbara Kruger in her end of um, season speech in, in the parliament actually said she wants to see agricultural issues debated in a constructive manner. So we don't get in the position that we did last time where we had the Morrinsville rally and, and a lot of rhetoric flying around. And I think we do have real issues to address. Let's address them constructively, put our ideas out there and um, you know, see, see what comes of it. But I think that's, that's a big part of what we can do, uh, particularly as politicians, to help address these issues. Well, Mark, next time, next time you're flying into Dunedin from uh, back to the South Otago farm, just divert into Dunedin and I'll give you a wee hug. Thanks, mate. Yeah, okay. Look, uh, our next topic of discussion is, and this is a good one, digital connectivity. Now, I'm not pointing the finger here because in fairness to the current government and the previous one, some really good work has been done here. But I think if COVID's proved anything, it's just really hammered home the importance of digital connectivity. Once again, from the snapshot survey from Dairy NZ, and these are really surprising numbers for me. And I might start with David Bennett on this one, because generally dairy farmers are farming closer to town than say sheep and beef farmers. But look at these stats, David Bennett, 50% of dairy farmers said they don't have the broadband internet they need on farm, and 52% of them don't have the mobile reception they need on farm. Those numbers surprise me. Yeah, and they're not good enough. Um, these are modern, sophisticated business people and businesses that need the connection so that they can operate their business. They also need that connection for their families, um, their children, you know, as you mentioned, COVID does have an influence on, you know, the ability to go to school and sometimes if there's a lockdown and um, they need to have that connectivity at home so the children can learn and keep up with their studies. Um, it's about giving them the tools to be um, part of a modern community. And I take real offence at what James Shaw said before. It was insulting to say that farmers get their information from Talkback Radio. We are the most sophisticated business people in this country. We understand exactly what's happening over in, in international markets. We understand exactly what's happening in our own domestic um, economy. We are not some group that um, just takes and laps up information from some media moguls that James and Mark are trying to talk about. The reality is our farmers are the best in the world. They deserve to have the best technology in the world. And we started that with the broadband scheme and it's been carried on by the current government. But we know this government can't deliver. There's another 300 sites that need to be built by 2022. Um, we doubt very much if Damien's team could even try and build those if they were given that opportunity. We need a national government in there that will actually deliver those. And there's prospects for expanding that scheme. And when you talk about, they'll come on and say, oh, we're giving another 50 million here and there to it. But that's not to give more coverage, that's just to work on the existing sites. And we need to have more coverage out there. And I challenge the government members to, to actually do that. And when they talk about mental health and the 1.4 billion they gave there, they've only spent 20 million this year. They just can't deliver and I don't think they're going to deliver for farmers in the technology sphere either. All right, Damien, right a slide for you if I can. Um, the national government, the previous national government, uh, did a reasonably good job on broadband rollout. You might have say you picked that. up the ball and run with it? No, they didn't do a good job at all. In fact, they spent over a billion dollars in the cities to expand uh, rural uh, ultra-fast broadband and spent a pittance in the rural areas where we needed the money We've put 130 million and just announced another 40 million recently between um, the the, um, uh, the provincial growth fund to get more. There's black spots out there, so we're putting up mobile towers. Very, very important. And COVID has, as you say, heightened the the awareness of the importance of, of of connectivity in the rural areas. Most farms are using modern technology. They need to be in touch with their their companies. Uh, Nate. 
um, has to be updated, it should be. Um, and so that's why we are putting money out there um, from black spots and from a road safety perspective, more money in, working with smaller providers through often uh, through radio technology to get broadband into those little valleys where um, the normal, the big providers won't provide the service. And I'm um, dealing with an issue in South at the moment where um, Vodafone uh, through Farmside and then Vital, three companies involved in trying to deliver to an area there. Uh, in the end, um, the contracting system that we have in place and had for a while hasn't dealt uh, or hasn't given the best service for rural people. And we've got to change that and we'll just keep pouring money in until we do get the service that we need. Um, I'm going to go to you, Mark Patterson. You had the Provincial Growth Fund, $3 billion uh, at your fingertips. You, you could have done worse than spent the whole lot on broadband for rural New Zealand. That would have been as much help as anything, surely. Yeah, well, some of it has, has gone into that. But I, I, well, how much? Uh, well, I, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but I know uh, in areas like South Westland was uh, an early area that got about 12 uh, million out of that, uh, that particular fund. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, you can go into areas in central Southland that are essentially uh, flat and not be able to get mobile coverage. So we do need to have to lift the, the game uh, significantly. So I've got no argument with what's been said beforehand. I will pick up on what Damien said. I think we've got to work much better with those small rural providers. Uh, there's a lot of, the, the contracting system hasn't worked well. Often they're going in there as private enterprise and then getting overbuilt by the big uh, companies. So I think we need to work with, and that's, that's certainly our position, that we need to work with those smaller providers to help roll out uh, the system that I think we'll probably all agree that we need. James, how does, this, how does this affect your constituency? Are you worried at all about the broadband connectivity for rural New Zealand, or are you more worried about Chloe winning Auckland Central? I'm, I'm, Fictitious uh, question. I'm worried about, uh, well, I expect nothing less. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm worried about digital connectivity right around the country, and that includes uh, the rural sector. Like it is clear that we need um, to have much greater rollout in rural areas. Uh, one thing I have to say that the lockdown back in March revealed is that um, even in places in our urban centres which have got good connectivity, actually in some places the technology is rubbish as well. So we've got to just keep on improving as a country how we do that. I had some Zoom calls with a bunch of farmers where I had people out in the country who had better con connection than people people in downtown Auckland, which um, I thought, you know, was a real problem in itself. So I do think that we need to connect it. If you look at people like Craig and Ros McKenzie and the incredible work that they're doing, pre precision agriculture and the internet of things and, you know, all their groundwater sensors that are all connected up, all of that depends on fantastic connectivity, um, both to the farm and, and like you say, um, with, with the mobile networks. Um, and I would love to see that rolled out um, very rapidly ar around the rest of the country as well and enable more farmers to take advantage of that, that really high tech precision technology that's out there. Right. With all due respect, though, Craig and Ros McKenzie, post it, farmers, if you want uh, for precise agriculture, they're not a mile out of Ashburton. So no, they're, no but uh, uh, that's, pre that's precisely my point, Jamie, that, that actually if we want everybody else to be able to have the kind of technology that they are using out there in Methven, then actually we need to have that kind of connection everywhere where we have farmers. Otherwise, they're just not going to be able to get the productivity gains and the efficiency gains that, that the McKinsey's have gotten on their farm including in the Wop Wops where Damien lives. Let's move on to subject number four. Hey, don't talk about the West Coast like that. It gets very defensive. I, it's all right. I take it with pride. Don't worry. <laughs> Mark Patterson and Shane and Winston are going to spend some money over there to try and buy a seat there. Now, climate change, topic number four. Uh, and I might stay with you on this one, James, because you are the Minister of, uh, for Climate Change. 40% of farmers surveyed said that their biggest concern when it comes to climate change is the public not appreciating how low carbon they already are? How low do you want them to go, James? Well, it, as low as is necessary in order not to have a negative effect on on the climate, right? Uh, and and, and that it, they that, go so low that they go out of business. No, and and actually it's absurd. And I, look, this myth, Jamie. You know, we've travelled around this the last several years. Um, what what we're asking farmers to do is one percent a year on average um, over the course of the next ten years, right? So it's it's a very marginal reduction in, in biogenic methane. Uh, and and actually, if you um, uh, look at 
um, you know, the, what, what's actually required, we are waiting to hear some more definitive advice from the Climate Change Commission in the middle of next year, uh, which should give us a, a sort of a greater view of that. But if you look at countries that have actually made reductions, what they have generally found is that the transition has been far cheaper and far faster than anything that they modeled or predicted. Um, and the kind of, you know, multi-billion dollar price tag that David Bennett was bouncing around earlier, um, frankly, just isn't borne out with, uh, with the evidence. Now, here's a yes, no question for you all, and I'll start again with you, James. Do you agree, because the proposition has been thrown out there that um, we are a low carbon farming environment, do you agree New Zealand dairy farmers are the most emissions efficient producers of dairy products in the world? I'll start with you, James. This is just yes or no. Uh, yes, on the, basis, on, on the basis of what I've seen. Mark, Patterson? Yes. yes. David Bennett? Yes. Well, you're a cow cocky. <laughs> I mean, you, you've milked a few cows in your time. Are we the most emissions efficient producers of dairy products in the world? I've seen that uh, stated. I've never seen the figures. Well, when you consider most other countries are using much more inputs, it would stand to logic that if we're grass feeding the cows, we're probably doing pretty well, aren't we? Yeah, there, there are a lot of systems that are lower cost than ours, and I haven't been able to assess um, whether that equates to uh, lower emissions. And, and that's the question that over time, what we have done is push up the inputs into our farm system. And so the low cost uh, carbon, uh, sorry, the, the kind of ryegrass clover mix that we had in years gone by um, has kind of been, has moved forward into, a, you know, what is often a ryegrass, a single species sward, um, and, and we're pouring on a lot of urea and, and we've, you know, there's a lot more inputs into the system, which mean we're not the lowest cost producers. And I haven't seen the calculations, the up-to-date calculations relative to other countries. All right, a reminder to myself, never ask the participants a yes, no question. Yes, yes. Um, <coughs> David Bennett, if our farmers are already the most emissions efficient in the world, and you guys have kind of indicated that maybe we are, are we not undermining our international competitiveness and global markets by heaping more costs? onto them that, for instance, overseas competitors might not be facing? I suspect I know the answer you'll give. Yeah, and um, just to following up from what Damien said, it'd be interesting to see if he's gonna support the Greens policies around uh, removing PKE from the, you know, the New Zealand dairy farming sector and also the nitrogen um, removal as well that the Greens are advocating for. But, you know, the, the Zero Carbon Act um, was passed to set up as an independent commission um, national supports that uh, the commission, uh, but we did that on the basis that there would be some criteria that we believe the commission needs to relook at, and one of those was to set the methane target and not have it set um, by government ministers like uh, we have at the moment, and that would enable us to look through the science around it and see what is possible. And um, you know, we wanted to see um, a reflection of the Paris Accord as well. Um, you know, we've got a discrepancy now between our our local requirements and also what we signed up for. Um, you know, we wanted to step in, stay in step with other countries and we wanted to consider the use of offsets and things like that. So we had some broad range of issues that we felt that the um, Commission needs to look at and, um, and they weren't supported by the other political parties. And uh, you know, they've got a very draconian system in place and the numbers of those five to $12 billion of costs is, is formulated by Dairy NZ, they're their very own numbers, James. Uh, they're not our numbers, they're the sector's numbers, and they reflect the difficulty um, of what is being proposed. And, and the Greens will go around saying, it's oh, only 1% each year, don't worry, you can do that. Uh, that's just rubbish, you know. The sector came out and went through and they looked at what they could do, and they want to actually make change in this area, um, and they're not, they're not hiding behind anything in the past or anything like that but they want to do it in a practical science-based way and the government isn't listening to them. They're just doing things in a dogmatic way and that is to the detriment of all right. <laughs> Your fingerprints are all over the Zero Carbon Act. Are those methane uh, targets, do you agree these targets need to be reviewed or are you quite happy with them where they are? What, 24 to 47%? They're big numbers. They are being reviewed. Climate Change Commission is reviewing them now and we're expecting their advice at the end of May next year. Oh, good. What can we expect them to go down to? I see David shaking his head. They are. 
I've, I, I, I've, I've well, asked them for their advice agree. and they are providing their advice. James, do we agree that, that oh, I think the top threshold was 47, correct me if I'm wrong, you've got your uh, head around this, that's just too high, unachievable. Uh, look, I had people um, in the sector, contrary to what David's uh, at more of his mythologizing, um, but I had people in the sector who told me that 10% was too low and that I should give them a real challenge um, because they felt that actually there was um, a lot of scope to get more than that, particularly when you look at some of the research that actually David's government paid for over the last 10 years uh, into what was possible on farm. And we've seen um, reductions on, on farm of anywhere between 14 and 24% um, in very short periods of time, um, in, including increases in profitability. Um, and that's as a result of reducing input costs, um, managing, the, uh, managing the farm more efficiently uh, and focusing on value rather than volume. Um, and so I think that, um, uh, you know, David's kind of um, approach, which is to fossilize the industry and its status quo for all time, uh, which it, frankly, when you consider the way that farming has changed over the course of the last hundred years, uh, it has never stood still. It has always evolved and developed. And um, the idea that we should actually preserve it in some kind of stasis, uh, I, th I think is a, a recipe for disaster for the sector. Well, talking about fossils, let's go to New Zealand first. Sorry about the dad jokes there, Mark. Um, uh, where do you sit on this? I'm only, I'm only 50, Jamie. I'm not talk, I was talking about someone higher up the food chain than you. Uh, yeah, well, look, you know, I, I, you know it's, it was the National Party that signed us up to these uh, targets. So it, it always grates me when I hear these kind of uh, vindictive uh, commentaries. But Ultimately, if you look what's baked in the cake, the 10% by 2030, there was agreement on that across the parliament. Uh, it was in line with what Dairy NZ and Fonterra had um, said was uh, acceptable. And if you look at those longer term targets, 24 to 47, well, 24 is where Dairy NZ uh, came to in there. So at the lower end of their target, we're actually consistent with where the industry had pitched. But uh, to James's point, we're going to have uh, is it three adjustments of the carbon budget uh, before 2030, uh, and we'll have four elections before then. So all that stuff's not, that, that stuff will evolve over time as the various technologies come into play, whether that be the inhibitors like the red seaweeds or the free NOPs or the genetics or the, you know, the ryegrasses even that, uh, or the forage crops. So there's a plethora of technologies there that have been developed. Uh, vaccines as well. So we've got time to buy that. The only stuff uh, that is baked in the cake is the 10%, which is where there is uh, consensus around. So uh, it's disappointing to hear the negative rhetoric from Beno on this. Well, David, I feel, I feel that you're being picked on here somewhat. Where's, um, where's David Seymour uh, when you need him? Uh, <laughs> yes. I feel oh, we don't need David Seymour, but... Um, I, I feel it's, it's all right. It's all right. No, that wasn't well, just, a um, That <laughs> wasn't right, a please. Please. Look, I need, I need to keep on, guys. You're doing very well. I'll just have well. a brief comment there, uh, Jamie. Just given, you know, on, on well, this. How come you're allowed one and David isn't? Yeah. yeah. No, no, David started. I haven't had him on this issue. No. Um, so you just you kick your notes. And, and look, the, the issue he claimed at um, PKE, look, let, let, um, never say never. And I think New Zealand farmers are the most innovative and adaptive in the world. That, that's, I think, goes without saying. And the 10% target, as, as we've all agreed, is achievable. The next target won't be set by politicians. It'll be set by the commission. That's laid down in the law. Can I just say that in terms of PKE and, and end removal, we don't advocate for taking those out of the farming system. But I meet more and more farmers and companies like Southern Pastures who are saying we're going to farm without PKE and some who are going to reduce their nitrogen input because they see the value in the marketplace of the products that they're producing. We have to go to the market and see what people are seeking. And actually, some of those farming systems that don't use PKE are getting a premium for the products. The no, end, you're, you're jumping the gun there. We're going to come back to right. we're going to come back to PKE. I need to move on. I'm going to give David a Bennett first crack at this topic number five is water storage, and I think uh, his party has perhaps done better work on this than your government, Damien, prove me wrong. And this is in response to the survey once again. 63% of farmers said that their farm, and this is dairy farmers who are farming on the best land in this country, certainly the best pastoral land, 63% of farmers have been impacted by drought 
in the last 12 months. And James Shaw knows all about climate change. We are headed for more extremes. Surely it's a no-brainer, David Bennett, for the government to pull its finger out and make more investment uh, in water storage. Hi there, Jamie. And if they're serious about the primary sector at this time of a need for the country, um, you'd be investing in the primary sector and giving it the ability to do that. The basic reality is you can't grow food and veggies if you don't have water. And um, so you need water storage for, the, for that. And for dairy farmers, you need water storage for resilience. We've had big droughts throughout the New Zealand and that statistic shows that. And it gives flexibility in land use, it enables increased economic potential in areas. Um, it's a win-win for the whole country, more employment, higher value add products, all those things come through water storage. And it's important that we also look at water storage in an urban capacity as well. A lot of these water storage projects, um, and especially in Mark's area, you know, can do have an urban aspect and a rural aspect and an environmental aspect as well, uh, because they can help with river flows and such like in the summer period. So water storage is not just about um, using land for um, more rural um, production, it's also an urban and, um, and also an environmental aspect. And this government stopped all the water projects that were in, in process. They effectively wound up the Crown Irrigation. Well, Damien, you can shake your head, but you know you did that. We're on the select committee. We don't even review the Crown Irrigation anymore because they do no more work because you stopped them and you took away the money from the projects. And now you're shaking your head in agreement because you know you did that. Yeah, we haven't and, stopped water projects. We haven't stopped water projects. Well, That's... you stopped the funding for them, no, which is not. effectively the same thing. And, no, um, so, so the, um, no, there's other facts, because a lot of those projects relied on government support, loans or, or funding in one way or the other. Crown Irrigation was providing that. That was stopped under this government. And we've had a couple of little token things up in places like Northland um, through Mark's team just to try and win a seat at the end of the election campaign. Uh, but there's no prospect of any decent water storage from those three below me. Uh, the, 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 the Greens uh, dictate what Damien does in this area and David Parker decides what happens and they've decided they don't want any more water storage and so Damien's had to fall in behind and, um, and we have got all those schemes that could have been helpful for New Zealand going forward have been canned because of Damien's team. Well, I think I'm almost, I'm almost with you on that one. Look, Mark Patterson, I want to go to you. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Jamie, you want a chance to come back at Hang that. on, who's in All charge here? Yeah. Right? No, hold <laughs> on. Let's come back. Yes, Crown Irrigation Limited is still there, but a lot of the funding has come back. Most of it's actually gone back into irrigation spend. We've committed $94 that million isn't. through PGF to 17 water storage projects, right? That's the reality. And we committed another $100 million through... Um, investment and in infrastructure post COVID. That's what we have done. And, but what we're doing is this 30, 60 million to extend the existing schemes, 30 million for new projects, and 10 million to identify new projects. We understand the value of water and we're committed to it, but not the big large scale schemes, some water from which has not yet been taken up. So we are focused on water, the right amount of water in the right place for the right reason. Da Damien, it sounds to me as though you're damned if you do, damned if you don't, yeah, no yeah, bad yeah. pun intended. I just want to stick to the no, no, Hang on, hang on. It's all very well saying you don't believe in large-scale uh, water storage. You want small to medium, vote-buying dams up in Northland for Mark mm. there. But what about the economies of scale? What's well, wrong with the big dam? What is wrong with the big dollars? dam in central Hawke's Bay? 120, that, that was an issue for Hawke's Bay. They couldn't decide whether they wanted it or not, to be fair. And when Hawke's Bay can sort out whether it wants that dam or not, maybe you'll get a commitment to look at that again. Mark Patterson, I throw it at you that maybe you could have spent some of the PGF money on rural broadband. You should have spent the rest on dams. Well, as Damien pointed out, we have spent a significant amount of money. And I think uh, you were talking 17 projects. I think there's, uh, if you add up some of the feasibility work in that for future projects, it's up around 35 uh, projects. So, uh, but having said that, uh, and I hate to be seen probably to be agreeing too much with BNO, but I think that water storage is probably the greatest opportunity that we have uh, in terms of growing the value of our agricultural sector. I think we have to put much more emphasis on that. We probably have to have a bigger helicopter view rather than 
maybe waiting for the Hawks player to come to us, we have to be in there working with them uh, and saying, well, this is what we're prepared to do. You know, meet us halfway. Uh, you know, this is a huge opportunity. We've got climate change. We've got to be able to mitigate uh, the worst effects of that, diversify, build resilience. Uh, it is, in my view, the lowest of low-hanging fruit in terms of uh, agriculture, and we'll be pushing very hard for water storage in the next government. Should we have a problem? Why didn't it happen in this government, Mark? Well, it, it, um, the mega schemes have come off the table, uh, and that's not necessarily uh, that's, that's been the political reality of it. But we're, we're talking about the next parliament, and we'll be certainly advocating strongly for that. Well, Mark, we're having a bit of difficulty picking you up there. You might want to pay the power bill, and we'll go to you, James. I'm actually, actually, I was going to say, stop it, Mark. You'll have me voting New Zealand first. Uh, uh, James, what, what's wrong with dams? What's wrong with water storage? Why are the Greens so against all this? We're not. So actually, when in fact, I'll, I'll tell you just to back up the truck a wee bit. Um, I heard I got an email from a farmer up in Northland a few weeks ago who had inherited his farm from his father, uh, and he said that you know his father and his entire life had had to t deal with two droughts of the kind that we had recently in Northland. Um, but the farmer who wrote to me, the son who had inherited the farm, has had four of those droughts in the last ten years to deal with. Right, so he he's kind of right behind um, the stuff that we're doing on climate change because he is seeing the effect it is having on his farm and, and on his business. Um, and when we made the decision to wind down the kind of mega projects that David's government um, was uh, funding, um, we actually made a decision as a cabinet about the kind of principles that um, good water storage management should take. And it actually is the kinds of things that David was talking about. So things that can have, can have an environmental benefit, things that are important for potable water, which we know is a, we've got a real crisis on our hands in terms of access to potable water in, in this country. Um, where um, actually we do have the kind of water that we need for uh, horticulture and agriculture and, and, and so on and so forth. But um, the problem with the national government's approach is a bit like their approach to roads of national significance. They stripped all all the funding out of the regions um, and spent it on about half a dozen mega projects into the cities, right? And, and that was their approach to, to transport was just to, to put all of the money into a handful of massive and very expensive projects, which benefited a very few number, uh, very few number of people. They had the same approach to these enormous water storage projects where you had, you know, large scale projects that were being funded that would actually have fairly limited benefit. If you if you take a more distributed approach where you have many more but uh, smaller landscapes uh, scale um, uh, storage projects out. That's a much more resilient uh, kind of um, network, um, able to deal with the kinds of changes in the weather patterns that farmers are seeing. But James, is that the case? Can then can why can't just, farmers um, store their can own water? I just there? clarify at some facts? So I acknowledge yeah. that the well, previous national government spent $400 million in irrigation schemes and was quite proud of it. We have spent 190, that was over nine years, We've spent $194 million over three years. We are committed to water storage, but appropriate size water storage. Those are, those are not new schemes, Damien, the ones that you've been funding, the ones that we started. And James, no. if, you're so, if you're so careful about having um, enabling farmers to have resilience around water, why can't individual farmers on their farm store water on their farm? They can't because you have basically cut out all the big schemes and only want a couple of token little schemes that serve some political purposes. Well, David, if you're, saying, if you're saying that the Ruatanifa is a small-scale thing that happens on somebody's farm, you need to take another look at the plans. I never, I never said that, did I? No, you just you what you said is that farmers can't store spend. water on their farm, and that's why we can't. got rid of all the large-scale water no, storage. No, no, that, no. That's a completely no, incoherent no, statement. What does Trevor say? Order, order, order. <laughs> We're going to finish with topic number six. It is a lot more than that. Yeah. <laughs> this is the elephant in the room, water quality. Now, I'm going to ask you, Damien, and I've yep. asked you this before, and I'm going to ask you this again. Does David Parker hate farmers or just dislike them? No, he doesn't. But what he has seen is that the degradation of water, and particularly in Otago, where he has lived all his life, he, he has seen that degradation backed up by scientific analysis that said in some areas of intensive agriculture we've seen rapid degradation over the last 20 years and he wants to turn that around now there are issues around the social license it's not just 
uh, the trout fishermen, I have to say. There are people who like to swim in their local rivers, people who want to have, you know, good waterways or waterways with good swimmable quality. And so, you know, we've had to do something to turn around what has been ongoing degradation. It's hard, it's challenging, but we're getting there. And I think the vast majority of farmers out there understand what we're trying to do. The issue is how we do that. And that's what we're currently talking about. Why don't you take a carrot rather than stick approach? We have fresh water reforms. In, 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 the, in the 2019 budget, we put in $192 million for environmental projects, many of them to help farmers run better systems through extension services, to help with riparian planting. We are putting literally hundreds of millions of dollars to help farmers with riparian planting, with fencing, with better systems of farming that, that mean there's less impact on the water. That's the reality. Blah, 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 Damien. Look, and I'm oh, going to hold you. Don't have a look at some of the projects. No, no, hold fire. I want to go Pen to country. Mark Patterson. And Mark, I want you to unshackle any political uh, favouritism you may or may not have on this one. You're a South Otago farmer. Some of these uh, winter grazing practices that Damien and David are trying to put on farmers are just too tough. They're not practical. I hope you're going to rebel against these. Well, I think you've got to go back to first principles, Jamie, and, and wintering, particularly on slope, is, is a, an environmental uh, challenge. And, you know, we have seen some outcomes in terms of degradation of waterways that... So I don't think we can turn a blind eye to that. Uh, I think some of, some of the... Uh, you know, they're, they're going to be pretty challenging, some of those rules. There's no doubt about that. And I think we're going to have to look at building some flexibility into those regional councils in terms of stuff around, you know, the replanting the crops and, and the like. And I think we need to, to work with our farming uh, community around that. But I think if you go back to first principles, we have got an issue to address. Uh, and, you know, we, we, in terms of our markets, uh, our consumers, uh, and putting ourselves on a sustainable platform, uh, these are the sort of things that we're going to have to do. Um, I don't necessarily buy that. David, we be looking for some support from you on this one. Yeah, no, we're not having those weasel words around first principles and that, and working groups and stuff like that. Mark Patterson, you live down there, you know what's going on. The people don't want those kind of regulations put on them in a draconian way for Wellington. They want to be able to work in the best interests of their farming practices in their communities. And, um, and it's just uh, offensive that the government thinks it can set these nationwide rules and just impose them across the whole country, not taking into account different farming practices. Um, they tried it with their DIN levels, that got knocked back. Um, then they tried to come back with report after report and they've just been hiding behind negotiations for the last year. And then finally on the last day of parliament, they dumped down their freshwater reforms don't give anybody a chance to have a decent look at it. Um, it's not democracy in action. Uh, well, these, these are, this is a government that says it needs the dairy industry and to provide the future for New Zealand going forward. And at the same time, they wax them with rules once and once again with that. And we're not going to be having um, those kind of um, draconian rules set in place that farmers can't meet and have got real reason that they're angry about. And um, we need the politicians to listen to the farmers and work with them. The farmers want to have a sustainable future. They want to do the best they can for the sale of their products and, and the markets they're in. Um, they just need a government that works with them, not against them. Don't sure, sure, you're a reasonable man. Why not take more of a carrot approach rather than the stick? I know we shouldn't be dealing uh, with farmers with kid gloves. But honestly, David Park has got a big stick and he's beating them. Well, um, thank you for proving me right uh, about um, radio hosts telling farmers that people in the cities hate them so much because you've said that twice now uh, in this Where last segment. That? Can you just remind me of the occasion? Yeah. Well, David Parker um, is, you know, lives in a city uh, and so by extension um, just sort of feeds I'll into that narrative extension. about no, 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 how... No, 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 I'm not buying that, James. I, no, yeah, that's what you no, tried you, to well, do before. No, but you, you've... Yeah. I, look, I know, I, I know David Parker pretty well. 
uh, and I can tell you, he doesn't hate farmers. He doesn't even dislike farmers. And the idea that you would frame up the question saying, how much does he hate farmers? Just as part of that whole thing that you and the National Party are trying to uh, say that actually um, we just hate farmers. And, and actually we no, don't. No, no, James, hang on. We want, to be fair we, to me, we want our farmers to... James, to be fair to me, I've got Damien O'Connor, who's on my show fortnightly, as you are. I've never, ever suggested for a moment that either of you two hate farmers. No, but you say that David and, that, and James, is, as I would, refuting that, yeah. explaining why he's focused on this issue. That's what why I isn't it, if he, if Damien and Dave James, why doesn't, if he lives in Auckland now, why isn't he taking such an active interest in the Auckland issues about how they pollute their harbour and things like that? He so is. It's all focused on farmers, farmers, farmers. And, 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 um, and we're David, not seeing David. that kind of restriction. We're not seeing blanket rules put on councils around this. Are we? Yes, right. we are. No, we're not. Yes, we are. Um, no, we're not. Yes, not. we are. No, okay. All right. Okay, James, he James, said, she James, said. Oh, James yes. I want to go to you. I think you, you raise a, a true and valid point, not necessarily uh, for this debate, but these freshwater reforms will not only affect uh, rural New Zealand, they're going to take a heavy toll on urban New Zealand as well. So it's not as though it's all being lumped on the farmers. All I'm saying is, from someone who was born and raised in Otago and South, and like Mark Patterson, I'm surprised he's ducking for cover on this one, your reforms when it comes to winter grazing as they stand at the moment are just too tough. All right, we'll get a final word from all of you, starting with you, Damien O'Connor. Look, thank you very much. And, and some of those technical issues around the NES are being adjusted. The reality of different regions is being acknowledged and we'll work with the regional councils to make sure they are possible. But we want to get to the right space with all of it. Look, we have an incredible future. I think post-COVID, the production of food in the world is a huge opportunity. And we, we're living off our, our heritage and off our reputation of producing safe food to the world. We can build that further as our consumers look to animal welfare standards, as they look for impacts on, on climate change and emissions, as they look for water quality and social license. We have to match up to their expectations. If we can get more value for what we do out in the marketplace, then we can reduce some of the stress that is on farmers, I acknowledge. But the stress from financial pressure and the stress from media perception is at the same level as that from uh, uncertainty around regulation. So we all have to take that on board and make sure we support farmers and get us into the right space so that they get more for what they do, not just ask them to do more. David Bennett, it looks like it's uh, my fault in the media and yours in the National Party. Final word from you. Yeah, well, I agree with Damien. We've got a brilliant future ahead of for farming and, and our primary sector in general. But we need a government that's going to provide the, the resources for the farmers to get ahead. We need that water um, storage. We need rules that are practical and science-based. We don't need draconian rules set by government. We need a, a, a government that's going to work with farmers, not against them. Um, we, we need a government that doesn't try and hide behind, um, you know, reports and negotiations to try and mitigate issues in election year. We actually need a government that's out there that actually supports and believes in farmers. And, and that's what you get from a national government. Um, we will support farmers. We will work with them. We will be practical in, in, a, in our approach. And we're not going to be um, a party like you see from the three governing parties at the moment that um, put draconian rules on communities that don't listen to the farmers, that aren't willing to engage and are just doing what they think is in their best interest. Because farmers are business people and they're part of our communities and they know what they need to do to make the best sales in the world and they know, know what they need to do with their products. We need to give them that opportunity and not be something that hamstrings them and um, stops their future and their prospects. Some solid, sensible South Otago comments from Mark Patterson to finish. Okay, well, I, uh, I absolutely... Thanks, James. Uh, yeah, James is going to get a call as well. But, yeah, no, I, look, I, I agree with the sentiment. I think our opportunities have probably been uh, a, a fantastic. We're at an inflection point, uh, at, and it's fair to say. We've got some issues to address. Uh, in terms of New Zealand First, we won't be burying our head in the sand and just uh, putting out rhetoric that uh, doesn't match the reality that we're facing. Uh, that, you know, there's uh, uncertain times, but we are doing our best in terms of, as this government, in terms of uh, putting farming on a more sustainable platform. Uh, and there is great opportunities, there's great opportunities 
around water storage. Uh, we need to do more in terms of science. We need to do more in terms of getting young farmers onto farms, and that's something I'm going to be focused on. We need to do more around the opportunities around uh, wool and uh, some of the issues that are um, uh, around that. So there is huge opportunity, but it's not going to be dealt with by burying our head in the sand and getting into negative uh, rhetoric. So we'll be a positive voice uh, and a constructive voice uh, for farming. And a final, a final word from you, Rich. I don't always agree with everything you say, but I think you're quite a smart man. There you go. <laughs> oh, I was going to say. Um, so, Jamie, right at the start of the show, you asked about my uh, history in farming. Uh, and I grew up in Wellington City, but my mum and uh, my uncles and aunts and my grandparents farmed for 100 years uh, on a farm in the Eastern Bay of Plenty outside of a portiki. Um, and the stories that they have told me about how hard life was and how much farming changed over the course of the five generations that were on that farm have shaped me a great deal uh, in the interactions that I have um, with farmers up and down the country. And I do not buy the rhetoric um, that David spreads that farmers are victims or that they are incapable of change. Um, if there's anything that the last century has told us, um, it is that actually farmers are incredibly innovative, they are incredibly adaptive, um, adaptive to, uh, to change circumstance into changing markets overseas and right now what we know is that the greatest value that we can get for our products is um, from people who want to buy a hundred percent pure heritage food um, that comes with a great provenance in terms of the soil and the air and the water and the quality with which it is grown. Um, and the way to ensure that uh, is to ensure that we have really strong environmental standards that underpin all our farms up and down the country. There we go, today's Dairy NZ political panel. Damien O'Connor, Minister of Agriculture, thank you very much for your time. David Bennett, Nationals Agriculture Spokesperson. Mark Patterson, New Zealand's first ag guy. And of course, Green Party co-leader, uh, James Shaw. We can agree to disagree on something, but I'm sure we all agree this has been a worthwhile debate. Bring on October 17. Thanks guys. Thank Cheers, you. Cheers, no Thanks, mate.